come and the digital clock has chimed seven uh, and it's time for me to introduce you um, to our second Science for Citizens seminar of the 2021 season. My name is Tom Miller. I have the honor and privilege of being the director here at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, part of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And for the last decade or so, we've been offering a series of public seminars, five in the spring, five in the autumn, where we try and bring the best of our science to the community to explain who we are, what we do, and why it is important. Up until last year, we had always done these lectures in person. We had always offered tea and coffee, coffee thanks to the kind people at PNC Bank and Southern Maryland Toyota and Team Hyundai. Um, we have no need for tea and coffee, sadly, to, to feed you all. Um, but those three corporations have continued to sponsor us and help support our students, and we thank them for their support. Tonight, um, we have a real pleasure in store. Uh, it is my honor to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Victor Kennedy. Uh, Vic has spent a long and illustrious career at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, starting um, shortly after his graduate degrees at our, what was then Halloween Point Field Station, working on uh, thermal ecology and, and siting of power plants. Uh, shortly after that, he moved over when our sister laboratory, Horn Point, was established, continued working on important questions uh, throughout his career at Horn Point. And we are delighted to say he, when he retired from Horn Point, he moved back to this side of the bay uh, and joined us as an emeritus fa faculty. It's not uh, an exaggeration to say that Vic has written the book or at least edited the books that define our understanding of charismatic species in the Chesapeake Bay with important contributions on Eastern oyster, on blue crab and on the diamondback terrapin. There's another one in the works, which I'll, I'll leave him to tell you about. But he's also written most recently uh, a book on what's now known as historical ecology, where we try and reconstruct um, what happened to ecosystems in the past, providing their historical contents to understand the future. And so tonight it is my great pleasure to introduce Vic Kennedy to talk about the protein factory that is or was the Chesapeake Bay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tom. Let's start here. So thank you for that introduction and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, some of the history of Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a very interesting environment, wonderful estuary, and at one time was extremely rich in its uh, natural resources, but that uh, kind of, we messed it up a little bit as uh, we went along. And so it, uh, there were North American Indians who, um, let's see, I'm not getting this thing to move. So it would be tech, tech support. Yeah. yeah. Now try so keep, keep pressing the, the button there. Yeah, just press down. Okay, we had to run a, a, a check, test run of this half an hour ago and it worked out. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, when the Europeans came over here and uh, settled, they find that the uh, Chesapeake Bay had a number of uh, uh, Native American Indians living along the coastal shoreline, and they took advantage of the uh, estuarine habitat and the food supplies that were available. And they were quite uh, clever with regard to what they, uh, uh, how they fished. You can see in the upper left corner there is a, a fish trap made of uh, made of uh, poles and reeds. Uh, and that fish would swim into and get trapped in a small compartment and the Indians would go on and take them out of that. Uh, Indian women uh, would make net, net material, twine by taking 
plants of certain kinds and uh, rubbing them and turning them into twine they then used to, to weave nets and to uh, in the back of the canoe you can see uh, a net that is used for dipping uh, fish out of the water. The man in the back of the canoe is using some kind of an in instrument that looks like a rake and I uh, tend to think that he might be using that to rake up oysters from the bottom. Now in the background you see men with spears and fishing like that implies that the uh, water column is clear enough that you can see the uh, fish that you're trying to spear. And so the uh, colonists reported that the water indeed was clear. There were lots of abundant sea grasses. And in this uh, diagram that you're seeing, this 1500 uh, year diagram, uh, there are in the bottom right hand side, there are two horseshoe crabs, implying that the illustrator. Uh, could, I knew that they were crawling around in the bottom, presumably able to be seen from the surface. The numbers of the, the Indians in tidewater settlements was low, so they would not have a major effect on it. But as the uh, Europeans flooded into the system, populations expanded, there was an increase in the large effect. H.L. Mencken, reporter for the Baltimore Sun, is the man who coined the terms immense protein factory of Chesapeake Bay. And out of the bay, he said, uh, we ate divinely. So how did that happen? There's a man called Mackay Laffin, who reported in 1877 that a plain winter dinner in Maryland consisted of the materials you see there on the screen. And this was a winter dinner, so Shad was missing from this. But I'm going to be talking about um, these creatures that you see here that made up a plain winter dinner and explained to you what happened over the years with the harvest. So tonight's talk, I'm going to do a, have a quick look at the history of the harvest records of some of these uh, fisheries. Then I'll spend more time on details of the oyster fishery and the Shad River herring fishery. The oyster fishery at one time in the uh, late 1800s, uh, Maryland and Virginia landed more oysters than the European uh, oystering nation and landed oysters over in Europe. So a very wealthy uh, fishery. Shad, um, Chesapeake Bay area, the shad harvests were the greatest along the east coast of North America. And then, I'll, so I don't end on a, a note of a gloom and doom, we'll talk about some restoration efforts for these uh, creatures. So here's a quick look. Declines in harvests over time. These five graphs are set up the same basic way. Uh, along the bottom, you see that they start around 1870s, 1880s, and uh, go out, stretch into the, uh, the 1900s and one of them into 2000. And on the uh, vertical axis, those are the landings. In other words, those are the harvest landings at the time. And you see that for shad, for example, oh, the, the upper two, the landings are in uh, millions of pounds, the middle two are in thousands of pounds, and then back to the oysters is back in millions of pounds. So you see that peak around the 1880s, uh, 1890s for shad, and then the great decline uh, into the 1984 and beyond. Same thing for river herring to a certain extent, a peak early on. In that case, uh, the harvest stays steady for some uh, years and then goes into time. Terrapin, the same situation for them and for sturgeon. And finally with oysters, you have a similar situation uh, of them tapering off until the present time, uh, harvests are very low. So moving on to some early accounts of these organisms before I get into describing two of the major fisheries. This is a um, cartoon. It's not, uh, it wasn't drawn by somebody way back in the time. It's just to illustrate the fact that a statement by a Swiss visit, the visitor to uh, Virginia in 1701 wrote about the abundance of oysters and the fact that if you were sailing in the bay, uh, you had to be careful that you didn't run aground on them at low tide because with nobody exploring these uh, offshore oyster reefs, they just built up over the thousands of years and became a navigation hazard. It wasn't just the, the Swiss man who was talking about this, this has been other people have uh, remarked on this as well. And he also pointed out that the oysters were very large larger than what he was used to eat. Looking at shad, here we have a written account by a man called Gilbert Fowler, 
Uh, back in the late 1800s, the Pennsylvania fisheries people compiled uh, uh, people's accounts of what the fishery was like in the, the earlier century. And Gilbert Fowler was about 70 years old when he wrote this in, late in the 1800s about something that happened when he was about 25 or 30 years old. He said, you could stand on the banks of this, uh, of the uh, Susquehanna River at this area, and you could look downstream, and this would be happening in the springtime, you see great schools of shad coming up the river. And you can see them when you were a quarter mile away because they were so um, dense, these schools, and so compact that they created a bow wave uh, across the, from shore to shore. John Smith in uh, uh, 1612 wrote with Sturgeon in Virginia. And he pointed out that with nets, depending upon the, the size of the net, you could take great numbers of sturgeon back in those days, more sturgeon than could be devoured by dog or man. And remember, sturgeon can grow up to about uh, 14 or more feet long. They, these uh, sturgeon, these large sturgeon, could be captured in these nets um, quite regularly, so that, uh, the colonists had something to eat like that. But McKay Laughlin again, he's back writing something else. In this case, he's talking about diamondback terrapin, and he says that the old people in the eastern shore that he interviewed remember a time when a uh, few people were eating terrapin and they were so common that they were fed to pigs. And then uh, Laughlin said, well, that was in the past and uh, now people were eating uh, terrapin and he was concerned that they, they would go extinct. And finally, with regard to waterfowl, I remember now that in uh, Chesapeake Bay in the summertime, the waterfowl are up north in uh, Northern states and in Canada uh, in, uh, up, uh, in nesting season. And then in autumn, they fly back down and many of them end up in Chesapeake Bay region. So there were two Dutch ministers who were traveling in the late 1600s in the northern part of the Chesapeake Bay around the uh, Bohemia Creek, uh, no, the Elk River, sorry. And uh, they were riding around, and as they rode along the shore, they would uh, frighten the waterfowl, and the waterfowl would leap into the air and start flying away with a great noise of their wings. And then a couple of years, a couple of decades later, Thomas Glover Wright wrote that there were so many waterfowl in the wintertime that they might cover the water for two miles. Great mass of waterfowl. And we don't see that anymore. Now, one of the reasons we don't see as many waterfowl is Market hunters were allowed in the 1800s to go out there and shoot uh, waterfowl, uh, ducks, geese, swans, or they might be shooting deer. And they could bring the, whatever they killed into the towns and the cities and sell it to grocery stores and to butcher shops. Uh, and so that's what they call market hunters. And some of them would take advantage of the uh, uh, great numbers of waterfowl and have hunt guns, which you see on the left, or battery guns. And this is a picture with Dr. John Walsh who wrote about this. And a punt gun could be attached to a small boat, a punt, uh, and uh, it would be filled with uh, gunpowder and shot. And then at night, the hunter uh, would uh, quietly paddle up to a raft of uh, sleeping ducks and blow a hundred or so of them out of the water, kill them. And then uh, the hunter and the colleague would roll around with lanterns and pick the dead ducks out of the, uh, out of the water. So let's take a look at the oyster fishery and see how that proceeded. The oyster gear was initially simple and it still pretty much is. And the big change is it's more mechanized than it was then. Back uh, in the past, dredges were powered by hand, as you can see with this uh, two-man winch. There were also four-man winches. Uh, that could drag a, uh, a pull the dredge by onto the uh, dredge boat. And here we have two gentlemen whose job it was to do that. The one on the left, you see the dredge is empty and he's uh, obscuring one of these winches and he will be putting the dredge over. Meanwhile, the gentleman on the right, who seems to be past social security age, uh, he is pulling uh, or has pulled the dredge in. You can see the uh, part of the dredge uh, by his left hip. So that nowadays, of course, or 
later in the 1900s, they, they had uh, engines to do that pulling. The uh, shaft tongs, they're about the same as today as they were then, depending upon the depth that you were uh, trying to harvest oysters, uh, you use tongs of an appropriate length. And the um, improvement was mechanical tongs that you see on the right hand side. In that situation, they were invented by a uh, blacksmith in Solomon's. And basically, they're just uh, uh, metal baskets that go over and land on the bottom on the oyster bed. And then they're pulled up, and the arms will close the jaws and trap oysters in there. And then you winched it up, uh, you muscled it up to the, to the surface. Nowadays, they use hydraulics uh, to uh, close it. Uh, to, to, to close it, uh, the jaws and to raise them up to the surface. I found this wonderful uh, illustration of Tongers off Annapolis. This is a woodcut in a German book in 1881. And what we have here are tong boats. Um, and in the background, you can see schooners probably um, harvesting uh, using dredges. And this situation is most interesting. I have put two white rectangles to show you that these were sailboats. And this is a situation where the uh, tongers would sail out to the reef and furl the sails and then get to work just as they do nowadays in using tongs to bring oysters on board. This is 1881. Uh, a year before, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, which was a, uh, a publication of the time, said that you could see as many as 100 boats working on Tally's Point's reef, and they would be bringing in 30 bushels, which is probably all they were allowed to bring in a day. And uh, they would bring that amount of uh, uh, oysters into the system. Now, if you take 100 boats and multiply by 30 bushels, that's 3,000 bushels a day. And they said, uh, Frank, uh, Frank uh, indicated that this was uh, 450,000 oysters. Well, if you divide the number of oysters by the number of bushels, that tells you that there was an average of 150 oysters in a bushel at that time. I checked with DNR, and today uh, they figure there are 300 oysters in a bushel. So the oysters today are much smaller than the oysters were some time ago. And remember, the Swiss gentleman said he had to cut them in two before he could eat them. So let's do something more with this information we got from. Uh, Frank Leslie and from uh, the German gentleman. Let's say you've got these 100 boats and 30 bushels, uh, that's 3,000 bushels a day, and you're harvesting, you're allowing people to harvest five days a week, that makes it 15,000 bushels a week from uh, Tally's Point. Uh, the the uh, season lasts for six months, 24 weeks, multiply that by the 15,000 bushels, and you could say uh, Tally's Point could yield 360,000 bushels under that effort of harvest. Well, assume that they couldn't always get out every day. They had to sail out if it was too, uh, uh, the weather was too, uh, too uh, windy, or maybe the uh, bay had frozen over. Let's cut that uh, landing to half to 180,000 bushels from Tally's Point, possible in 1881. Well, I checked with DNR, and that's the same number of bushels that were harvested a couple of years ago from 318 oyster bars in Maryland. Tremendous difference in terms of the yield from one bar versus the rest of the bars in Maryland today. Okay, so the dredged boats, these are a couple of pictures of dredged boats, one of them in Baltimore Harbor, um, and the other one down in Cambridge Creek. And uh, in Cambridge Creek, it was said, and Cambridge Creek is not very wide, but it was said that you could cross the creek by stepping from boat to boat. There were many, many dredge boats. There were many tong boats. And here's a picture from uh, late 1930s, an aerial view of skipjacks and bug eyes that were dredging near Tillman Island at the time. And so in that area, uh, there are 29 uh, boats dredging back and forth under sail, uh, capturing oysters. The number of dredge boats at the moment, uh, it's, it's hard to get a, a real handle on it, but it seems that there might only be a dozen or more still sailing, and uh, over half of them are really for tourists to take you out. For instance, Cambridge, Nathan at Cambridge can be used to take you out for a sail. Uh, 
And so there are only a few three, four, five boats that are actually partly dredging for oysters uh, at this time. This is, that's a change from many hundreds of dredge boats that were licensed back in the 1800s and many thousands of tongues that were licensed back then too. The oyster industry then was huge. And so here we have two pictures from a report back in the uh, late 1800s of uh, shuckers. And of course it was uh, segregated in those days. So the white shuckers are on the left and, uh, and the black shuckers are on the right. So they would be standing at these stations and, and shucking as, as quickly as they could. And just out of um, some interest in people's changing uh, uh, dress habits, everybody in those pictures are wearing hats indoors. In the bottom picture, you see a number of oyster cans that uh, are from the Solomons region. There are about three or four processing plants represented by those cans. They're gallon cans and maybe a, a few um, quart and pint cans. And in the middle, you see one that says huitre, which is the French word for oyster, which tells me that those oysters were going to be uh, run up to Canada by rail. And somebody in Montreal, a few days after those oysters had been uh, caught and canned, would be able to eat oysters. Here's another picture from the same period of time in, in processing rooms. The oysters that were brought to the uh, uh, docks in Baltimore, for example, would be shoveled into carts, and then a horse would uh, take the cart up to the nearby processing firm that they were dealing with. And then the oysters would be loaded into these railroad cars, which would then go into the, the, the shucking area you see on the left. And on the right are the processing rooms where the uh, shucked meat from the oysters was washed. Um, it was put into the cans, it was hermetically sealed, it was cooked. And then when that was all done, it was taken to a place where labels were pasted on the cans if they weren't on the cans already. And it was estimated uh, back in those days that from the time that the oysters arrived in the processing shucking area in an average cannery to the time that it was ready to wipe the door inside a can hermetically sealed was an hour. So we have this situation if you see the, uh, the numbers there as to how many oysters were thought to be in the uh, in uh, Maryland uh, and 1% one, 1 of that is left at the present time. Things have changed. Oh, and another thing is one of the things that have changed enough. Everybody was wearing a hat in that uh, picture, those pictures as well. Canning was a year-round industry. This is a, an ad from William Redding in uh, Baltimore. Uh, Redding and Company uh, canned uh, oysters. They also canned fruit, meats, and peaches. Back in those days, Maryland uh, grew an awful lot of fruits and vegetables. And there were canneries that were set up to can fruits and vegetables and so on. And so that was a spring, summer, fall kind of an activity. And then in the late uh, fall and winter, when there were no more uh, fruits and vegetables uh, growing and being canned, they switched over to oysters, which were being harvested at that period of time. So this was a situation where you used pretty much the same facility for canning either the fruits and vegetables or the oysters. And it got to the point where uh, there was so much demand that there was an increase in the number of canneries in Baltimore area. And there were also canneries in Cambridge and in um, Oxford and Annapolis and Crisfield and so on. So oysters were shipped inland and were available for eating. Here is a, uh, a, an advertising card from one of the producers who produced diamond brand uh, oysters. And you can see that they had a, uh, a sales office, an outlet in Detroit. And one of the things I've done in the lower right-hand corner is I've got a, uh, uh, a map of the country and there's a red dot there showing where Detroit is located. Then here's a picture from 1881 in Mankato, Minnesota, where this meat market is advertising that it has oysters. And then finally, just to show these, uh, the extent of uh, how far these oysters were available across the country, and they went all the way to, to uh, uh, San Francisco, as a matter of fact, but here is a, uh, an oyster saloon, an oyster house in St. Louis, Missouri. And oysters were so cheap 
they were so easily accessible, even in the center of the country, that people would uh, go to these places for oysters for breakfast or for lunch or for supper or for after hours after they'd been to some sort of an event. They'd go to an oyster saloon and have some oysters. You could have them fried as fritters, you could have them as stews, soups, you could have them baked, or you could have them stuffed inside turkey. So they were cheap, nutritious, and much in demand. And this increased demand led to increased harvest. This is a picture of the catch of the skipjack. And they had now moved over to using engines to bring the, uh, the dredges on board. The one on the right has come in and they're emptying it out. And the one on the left is out being uh, dragged over the bottom. And so you can see the tremendous number of oysters that were on uh, the deck uh, being uh, harvested there or treated by men with caps. <laughs> so how did that, uh, how did, what happened to these oyster populations? Well, Dr. Elizabeth North put this together 135 years ago. You can see how many bushes were being um, harvested, how many people were employed, how many processing companies. And there was a lot, 330,000 acres of habitat that was suitable for growing oysters. Then there was overfishing and habitat destruction. So that 70 years ago, you can see the decline in the, in the harvest and in the number of people and processing companies involved. And the acreage had been damaged so that there was less of it. And then again, overfishing and habitat destruction, but disease also had an effect. And so we're now in a situation where we're harvesting a very small number of oysters, a limited number of people involved, fewer processing companies, and the suitable habitat is estimated to be down to 36,000 acres. So there's been a big decline. Now, um, Reginald Truitt, who established the Chesapeake Biological Lab where we are now, took this picture, I had this picture taken of a healthy reef where you can see in uh, 1931 that uh, there were plenty of oysters and there wasn't much sediment. And then, to, oops, sorry, 2005, Gary Smith took this picture of a reef, which is fairly typical. What's been going on is that as land around the bay was being cleared for housing developments, for factories, for uh, shopping centers, uh, parking lots, and the rest, for a long time, people just let the, uh, the sediment erode from the, the exposed land and it would go into the, the bay. And it would cover up the oyster beds and oyster larvae will not settle on shell that's covered with sediment. So it was degrading the habitat. There were so many oysters being harvested that there were oyster shell piles outside the harvesting areas, the, the harvesting facilities. Uh, two postcards from Hampton, Virginia. You see the men standing on the pile in the upper left-hand side. These were huge numbers of, of oyster shell and they were valuable. And Truett in 1921 wrote about this. He said, what are we going to do? Is this going to be used for roads, for chicken grit, or for oyster restoration. So even a hundred years ago, uh, people were talking about restoration because oyster shell is important to larva oysters that are swimming in the water, needing a place to settle, and then will settle an oyster shell. But if you take the oyster shell away, you take away uh, their habitat. Uh, back in those days, roads, like farm roads and so on, were, were uh, roads that could turn into mud roads. There were dirt roads that could become mud roads in rain. And so one of the things that you would do is you take oyster shell and put it down to set up a, a, a sturdy surface to improve the road. Or you could sell them to uh, people in the boiler industry. Uh, so there were individuals who would grind this oyster shell down to grit level, and the chickens would use that as part of their feeding activity. Truett was saying, let's get the shell back on the bottom. So we're going to look at this series of, of graphs to show how the graphs, uh, the harvest increased and then decreased. So there was a booming industry in the uh, late 1800s and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad expanded westward and that allowed the oysters to be moved out into the in, uh, central part of the country or up to Canada. Then you see early over harvesting after the 1900s there was this great drop off. And every so often the Maryland, Le Maryland legislature would say, what's going on? And they uh, set up conservation commissions and to investigate it. And commissions every decade or so would say, uh, you're taking too many oysters out, you're not putting shell back, you're harvesting animals that are too small, et cetera, et cetera. And the legislature would nod 
And then 10 years later, they asked the question all over again. They did institute a 10% shell tax. In other words, if you were a processor and you had that shell pile up there, you had to give 10% of it back to the state so they could put it overboard to um, help the um, reestablish the, the, the oyster beds. Uh, but for a period of time, that worked with a certain amount of stability. Uh, but eventually, the shell taxes uh, tapered off. And so the state started paying people uh, to dredge shell from beneath the uh, sediment in the bay, fossil shell that had at one time been a functioning uh, oyster reef, but that was overcome by uh, the sediment. But unfortunately, uh, after about 1959, there were two diseases that uh, really hammered the oyster industry, and it's been uh, difficult to recover from that. Let's move on and look at the shad and the river herring. To understand that, you have to realize that <clears throat> adult shad move up and down the uh, uh, east coast of North America. In the uh, wintertime, they're feeding down south, and then they have a, a spring migration up towards the Bay of Fundy in the Gulf of Maine. And on the way, um, adults that were spawned years before, let's say in uh, Chesapeake Bay, will swim into Chesapeake Bay to reproduce. Ones from Delaware would do the same in Delaware. And in Chesapeake Bay, um, the shad would swim up tributaries, including the Susquehanna River, as far as Binghamton, New York, which is a 500 river mile journey from the mouth of uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I show a picture of a shad on the right, and then uh, two uh, river herring, they're called that, they're ill-wise and blackback herring, but they're very hard to tell apart, so when people harvested them, they lumped them in as river herring. So we have this situation of a decline, in this case, landings in the shad, and you see that millions of ponds were being landed, and of course, since the shad were moving into Virginia waters from the Atlantic Ocean, the Virginia watermen had a chance at them first, and that's the uh, sort of yellow color there. And then any, any shad that escapes uh, swam up into Maryland and the Maryland watermen harvested them. So you see the decline in the landings over time. And how do you catch shad and river herring? Well, one of the uh, techniques you did was to use drift gill nets. A gill net is a mesh of netting. That's the uh, meshes are large enough that a shad will swim into it and will get entangled in it, they try to back out and they, their gills are caught by it. So here we are having a, a, a drift gill net being deployed at night. Uh, they have a, a, an oil lamp indicating one end of it and then uh, you row that into the center of the river. You put the net overboard as you go. It's got floats on the top and weights on the bottom so it hangs down like a curtain and you go to the other end and then the boat in front of the first row you see another oil lamp, you attach uh, the oil lamp to the end of the gill net, and then you roll back and forth through the night and uh, take the shad of the river herring out of the net. Another way to do it is pond nets, and these are like the uh, fish traps that the, the Indians had developed that were seen in that first uh, drawing that I showed you. There is a, a net stretching out to the shore. You might be able to see it right about here. It goes into the shore. Fish swim along, come to the net, and then they turn into deeper water. And that means that they go into those um, compartments in the pond that you see there and eventually end up in the left-hand side in the pond itself where they're dipped out by the fishermen. So to show, tell you what the shad faced in 1915 when they were swimming into the bay, there was an estimated 2,000 pond nets and almost 17,000 gill nets in Virginia water and uh, over a thousand pound nets and almost 4,000 gill nets in Maryland water to the point where they were so, uh, and took up so much space in the water that during World War I, the Navy had to tell uh, them that they couldn't put them in a certain area because they had to have a lane for the warships to go back and forth up. So you can see what's going on. Shatter coming in and they're facing this barrage of nets. And then there's also, uh, there are also seines. Uh, these are haul seines. You haul them in, or they're beach seines. You haul them onto the beach. And this is the largest seine in the world at Stony Point, Virginia, in the Potomac River. And this is a picture in the uh, uh, fish bull, fish, fishery bulletin uh, of the U.S. Fish Commission back 
at the turn of this last century. And this is a picture of this thing. You can see it's got almost two miles of net with four miles of ropes attached to the nets that you used. You pulled on the ropes and brought them back onto the shore and a huge sweep of the same. So one end of the net would stay on the shore. You'd row out into the center of the river and circle back to the shore again. And then in this case, the nets were so big that you had to use a, a steam engine and 80 men uh, to operate it. The men basically were there, uh, as you see, they're right in the water, some of them. They're standing on the lead line, the line that, or the weights that keep the, uh, the net on the bottom so the shad couldn't swim under it. And they're making sure that the float line stays up so the shad can't swim over. So at any rate, all of this, at, at early in the fishery, these net, this net was so big that they were able to capture sometimes thousands of shad and hundreds of thousands of alewives in one haul. Well, by 1905, the whole season, they had fewer shad caught the whole season than could have been caught in a single haul years before. So the fishery ended. It was too expensive. The net was expensive. They paying the laborers was expensive. Keeping the steam engine uh, in shape was expensive and it didn't pay. Now, as I said, these are hull seines on beaches, beach seines. So to have a, a, a beach seine working properly, you had to have a beach and offshore from the beach, you had to have no, nothing for the seine to, to hang up on, like the rocks uh, or like something that's sunk in the bottom, uh, tree trunks or what have you. And so uh, it was important to have a good beach area. But most of those beach areas, because this fishery was so extensive, were already taken up. If you were a farmer and you had a, a, a beach on your property, you leased it out. And so all of these were uh, leased, leased out. And so some people then built fishing floats in the Susquehanna River, in which you see there's a mess house, uh, well, a bunk house for the people that work, uh, a mess house to feed them, and then some place to process the fish that were being captured. And you pull the net onto this structure. And this is a seine boat. You see all the people that were involved in rowing out to the float. There's a seine on the back. And when they uh, deployed the seine, they'd row out into the river, pulling that seine behind them, circle back to the float, and then it would be pulled up on the float. And when they had um, the shad or the, or the river herring gutted and uh, clean, they would then put them into barrels of salt, and of course, they would then shuttle the barrels back to the, um, to the shore. This happened over a five or six week period around this time of the year, very intensive fishery. So here's the picture of a hull seine at Port Deposit. You can see the, the two men on the left there on the slope that you hauled the seine up on. You see the floats on the top and the weights on the bottom of this. You see the buildings that housed the men in the processing areas. You see the men wearing hats. And then this is a picture of another shad float around Port Deposit. And these, this shows a fish that had been captured in the, in the same. And the men on the left are putting in uh, planks to keep the shad from, or the river herring, from flopping back down into the river. So this was a tremendous amount of work and effort and you, it gives you some idea of just how much remunerative this fishery was that people could afford to build these floats and to hire the, the, the men to work on. Okay, why was there a decline in the, uh, these harvests of these fish? Uh, one was overfishing, as I mentioned. The second, of course, is these uh, creatures are swimming upriver. You put a dam in the way for various reasons and they're not going to be able to, to swim upriver anymore. Uh, you may have pollution that degrades the spawning habitat. And because there was a lot of demand for land development, sometimes some of this area was dredged for sand and gravel. So there are a number of reasons for the declines. But there are res restoration efforts. And I'll, I'll finish by just going over those. Uh, this cartoon shows the health of the bay declining. The numbers of fish and oysters, in this case, are declining. And you can either allow that to continue or you can try and, and restore as um, true recommended back in 1921 for oysters. So we're gonna talk about a restoration of these species I've been talking about. Oyster restoration, one of the ways of restoring it 
the tri or harvest free sanctuaries. A small uh, parts of the bay where there used to be the reefs are now places where you're not allowed to harvest them. The idea is that that allows the adults uh, to live there and then to grow and to get larger. And if they're developing disease resistance, then they will survive and pass this on to their offspring. The other thing is that uh, large uh, adult females, the larger they are, the more eggs they produce. And so that means the more potential larvae that there would be. And also the larvae that are spawned in the sanctuary don't just stay over the uh, oyster reef that they were uh, sp spawned on. Uh, currents will take them out of the sanctuary, carry them around, and they may settle on other beds outside that are a bit fishable and help supplement what larvae are produced uh, outside the, the sanctuary. Another way of restoring oysters in addition to the sanctuaries is to use hatcheries. And there's a major hatchery over on the Eastern Shore in Cambridge at the Hornpoint Lab, a sister lab to Chesapeake Biological Lab. And in this situation, the idea is that uh, for uh, oysters, most of the mortality or much of it is in the larval stage when they're swimming around in the water. And if you can grow them inside a hatchery where there are no predators, you can get them to a certain point that you can put, they've got the shell is larger and, and stronger, and you can put them overboard uh, to grow in nature. So on the left hand, you see a picture of an oyster spat. A spat is a settled larva. And you can see on the right hand side, a picture taken through a microscope. Uh, the P is the original uh, oyster larva that settled, and the D part shows the shell that has been growing uh, over the, the, the subsequent two or three days before this picture was taken. So you have this spat on shell, and uh, this is the way you produce that. I'll show you a little bit of a reproduction in a hatchery. Here's a picture of the Hornpoint uh, hatchery with a trough with oysters in it. You can't tell male and female oysters apart before they spawn, so you just put oysters into this. Then you run warm river water, warm estuarine water, in this case, chop tank river water over the oysters. And these, this would be happening right about now, uh, March and April. And these oysters have been uh, uh, brought in and uh, fed over the winter. And so they're ready to spawn. And if you raise the temperature, that stimulates them to spawn. And so what happens is you have males, picture on the right, uh, uh, sending out sperm, and on the left, female sending out eggs. And so you, what you do is you can then obviously tell which is a male and female. So you take the males and put them in one container uh, to continue spawning, and the females are another container to uh, continue to produce eggs. And then you take the uh, eggs and you run them through screens that will screen out debris and dirt from um, the shell, and you end up with clean eggs, and you have a container of oyster eggs, and you take some uh, sperm, small amount of sperm, add it to the eggs, and you have fertilization. And then you grow them in the hatchery, feeding them over a two or three week period until you get to uh, this stage here. And you can tell from the uh, shape of those larvae and the configuration that these are uh, getting ready to settle. And so if I can click this, you, this, they're under a microscope. You're looking at them under a microscope here. They're swimming around, they have the two shells that the bivalve uh, shell, and you can see the shape. They swim around, and if you take them and put them into a situation with clean oyster shell, they will settle on it. So what do they do? The Oyster Recovery Partnership works with uh, the uh, Horn Point Hatchery, and they use that spat on shell that's uh, been produced uh, in this fashion by starting off with metal cages. They have clean oyster shell in these metal cages, and those cages are then put into a circular tank, looks a lot like a swimming pool that you would have in your backyard. And, and you see that this person is standing in the, on top of those cages that are inside the circular tank. If you see behind these legs, the, uh, the um, sort of light brown colored rim of this um, tank, and behind that tank, you see another tank in the distance. So you get an idea, these are circular tanks. So you've got these metal cages, clean oyster in that, what they've done, clean oyster shell in that. Uh, what the hatchery has done is they run river water for a couple of days through that system um, to uh, get the shell ready to go. 
turn the water off, and then they pour larvae that are ready to settle into these tanks. Tanks have about 100,000 shells uh, in all of these um, cages. And then you add the larvae. Um, the larvae um, take advantage of the fact that the shell is there and they will settle on it and become spat on shell. Then this in turn, when uh, the technicians realize that this is the appropriate time, they will empty those cages into this boat and the boat will go out to wherever those uh, oysters, uh, oyster spat and shell are going to be dumped overboard and they put it on that place that they're trying to reestablish. So you get the shell down there and you get the oyster uh, spat and hopefully if all goes well, nature will provide enough food and there will be a limited amount of predation and the spat will get larger and larger until they're adult size and ready to spawn themselves. Now, restoring shad and river herring is a challenge because there are a number of things you can try and some of them are, that can be easily done and others not. First of all, you can stop uh, harvesting for the fish and so you're not allowed to just capture shad in, in Maryland at the moment. You can get rid of dams. This is happening up and down the East Coast in certain areas where the dams are no longer thought to be useful. Um, you can get rid of them to uh, allow the fish to migrate up past where they used to be. That's not going to happen at Conor Window Dam at the mouth of the Susquehanna. You can construct fish passage facilities to get around the dams. Uh, fish ladders, where the fish are directed into these, they uh, swim up the ladders and come out the other end. Uh, alewives seem to do that okay. Shad don't seem to respond as well. So in that case, what you can do is you can capture the fish below the dam um, by nets. You put them into tanks, uh, tank trucks, and you drive around to the other side of the dam uh, away from the, uh, the turbines and put the, um, the captured fish overboard and hope that uh, they'll survive, swim on up and reproduce. And finally, if um, they can get up to a habitat that's been degraded, you, you can <clears throat> improve, but that's expensive too. So all of this costs a lot of money. Sturgeon restoration is also a lengthy process because their habitat has been degraded. They're, if, if there are dams in the way, they can't swim up to, their, to where they would ordinarily spawn. And sturgeon take a very long time to grow and mature. That sturgeon you see in the hand there, many years will have to pass before it becomes a functioning adult. And you can't grow sturgeon in hatcheries and keep them for 10 or 15 years and keeping something that's going to grow to eight or 10 feet long. That's just not possible. You have to wait for nature to do it. Terrapin restoration is a lengthy process as well. There used to be terrapin farms in uh, different uh, parts of the United States, including here in Maryland. This is a, from Harper's Weekly, an illustration on the left. Two men are in the wintertime digging up terrapins. They use a long pole and probe it in the, in the marsh because in the winter the terrapins become dormant and uh, live in the sediment. And if you bump up against one, you pick it up, put it in your uh, bag and, and move on. And if you had a property on the edge of the river that had a pond in it, you could then join the pond to the river, have some kind of a screening device to keep the terrapins in the pond. You could put the, the terrapins in, in the pond. And then uh, if you had a beach in that pond that you have, the females uh, would then go and lay eggs and young would grow and you could uh, keep them uh, and feed them. And it's expensive to do. NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, had a lab at Beaufort um, in North Carolina, and they tried uh, growing terrapins. Terrapins are very smart when it comes to food. You see the man uh, there with the pail. When you take the food, like let's say some sort of fish, whatever it is, the terrapins, when you wrap on the side, the terrapins come running. <laughs> they know it's food time. But the problem is this, terrapins grow very slowly. There's a number of years before they can mature. They need soft sediment beach, the females do, to lay their eggs. And in the situation with uh, rising sea levels and erosion of the beaches, people are using riprap to harden their shores and uh, there's less and less uh, area for them to lay their eggs. And finally, with the onset of uh, crab pots, 
if a terrapin gets in the crab pot, it can drown if it can't uh, put its head above the water as they breathe there. And finally, with regard to waterfowl restoration, that fortunately is working. Uh, this cartoon of 1872 shows uh, the intense uh, hunting pressure that was on the waterfowl back in those days. But then market hunting was banned and bag limits were put in place. You wouldn't have a, a bag anymore like that one you see in the 1920 picture of Hubbard and Rice. Uh, so we have that. And then uh, Ducks Unlimited are working to protect and to improve breeding habitat in the northern states and in Canada. And so slowly, we ex I expect the waterfowl population numbers will increase under these conditions of cutting back on the harvesting and improving the habitat. And so with that, if you're interested in learning more about this, this is the uh, book that uh, Tom referred to that I wrote about environmental history of the Bay. Johns Hopkins University Press has published this. Uh, it goes into more detail about what I've talked about and adds additional information about the Bay itself and it's, uh, why it was so um, um, productive. And uh, so if you go to the Hopkins website and type in my name in the uh, search uh, thing for uh, authors will come up and Hopkins, if you're interested, will give you a 30% discount. So are there any questions? Thank you, Vic. Applause from, from us in the room. Um, for those in the audience, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box and I will pull the questions together um, to ask, ask Dr. Kennedy, the question. So, Vic, I'll, I'll start with the first one. What happens to the shad trucked above the dam after they spawn? How do they get back to the ocean? Well, it's an interesting question. They can always go through the dam, <laughs> but they don't want to. I don't actually know what I imagine that your basic orientation is to get these up there to do some spawning. And uh, then that's the way it is. On the other hand, if you think about it, how do the uh, young Shad come back down without being chewed up by the uh, by the dam. Yeah. So, so I'm I don't know what the answer to that would be, but it would seem to be problematic. Okay. So uh, another question from Marcy Turner. Um, certainly, improving water quality of the bay is of paramount importance. But with the lethality of modern fishing methods in each fishing excursion, is devastating. Is it even conceivable that we could ever see a bay with the abundance and biomass of the early 20th century? Well, the general idea is that you can never get back to work the way things were because I think so many um, environmental factors have changed. There are more people, um, there's more runoff. Um, and so I don't expect you're ever going to see, um, let's say more than three or four million bushels of oysters harvested instead of 10 or 15. Uh, but you certainly should see more than 180,000. Um, the waterfowl, the numbers should be increasing because of the things that I said at the end. Uh, I don't expect sturgeon to go back very quickly because it just takes too long for them to mature um, and you can't use harvesting. On the other hand, terrapin are coming back because some of these artificial islands that the Corps of Engineers has been established like Poplar Island, uh, they have sandy beaches that are heavily used by uh, the female terrapins. And so that's possible for the terrapins now that we're no longer allowed to fish them, uh, would become more abundant. Okay, great. Um, so next question from Ted Karski. How much of the traditional oyster beds are covered with sediment and are no longer good habitat? Well, you saw that the number now was estimated to be 30,000 acres, down from 200 some odd thousand acres like 50 years ago and, and so on. Uh, as I understand it, much of the oyster beds, except for the few that are real, uh, that are being worked over, are covered with, with sediment of some kind or other. And it's always been a problem, but it's been worse and worse over time. As we lowered the profile of the oyster beds by taking the oysters away and not putting shell by uh, they are in quieter waters, the, the sediments are more readily deposited on them. And I would think that a large proportion of the former uh, oyster beds, uh, 330,000 acres, are probably just covered over, which is where the fossil shell comes from, because the, the dredgers go up to where the oyster beds used to be, certainly not part of the bay, and they, they dig the shell out from underneath of the sediment. 
Okay, so these are two sort of related questions. So first from Tom Fisher, I don't know whether that's your former colleague, Tom mm -hmm. Fisher, or an entirely different Tom Fisher. The, what are your major recommendations for restoration for oysters, fish, and waterfowl? Related to that, from Nicole Feltz, um, asking the same question about larger policies in development to tackle these broad pro problems, but adds a particular addendum of, can we volunteer to help improve these restoration pr practices? So sort of what are the broad scale and, mm -hmm. and what are the scale that the individual could be engaged with? Well, let's start with oysters. I think that uh, one of the things that can help the oyster industry is to, instead of hunting oysters, as we've been doing for a couple of hundred years, we should go fish, uh, we should go farming oysters, which is the whole idea of agriculture. And uh, Maryland was the last state really in the union, uh, with that are possible to have oysters, uh, that has uh, continued to have an industry that is a public fishery and uh, they have been sort of uh, loath to have a private, uh, private fishery. And aquaculture just started in the last 10 years or so by being encouraged by the state. And that I think is going to help increase the number of oysters, not on oyster beds necessarily, but on in, in the market, okay? Uh, I don't know what you can do with shad and uh, river herring uh, because uh, of the factors that are in the way like dams, for example. Uh, uh, problematic habitat. Same thing for the, the other two creatures I mentioned that are very slow to grow, but the waterfall, as I say, can be coming back. Um, so I think that it, it looks better for oysters and waterfall than the other ones I've mentioned. The second question uh, was, was it, what, what can, can we do? individuals do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you basically have to become informed as to what's happening and then make it, do what you think might be useful to tell the politicians, because basically while we have a management agency, they really have to depend upon the laws and regulations that the, uh, the political folks uh, will allow to have happen. And you should be telling them, if you're interested in doing so, encourage oyster farming, for example, or uh, you, can, you can donate to Ducks Unlimited, which are doing a good job with regard to habitat restoration. Um, those are sorts of things. Be informed and try and let people know what you think. Okay. Um, so this is an interesting question and one that I must admit I would struggle to answer. So I'm glad that it's that it's you <laughs> being asked of the the qu question, and it's from. Um, oh, I've just gone scroll past it. So um, this is from Jack Morton. And he says, the ecosystem benefits of oysters seem clear. They filter the water, they provide habitat for other species. Could you describe the benefits from shad and sturgeon or are the benefits mainly from harvesting them? Well, yeah, from the human perspective, that's true. But obviously the, the, the shad and the river herring, they themselves as small creatures in the bay are food for other creatures in the bay. Uh, the same with the small uh, sturgeon. And so uh, they're part of the food web and they provided a benefit to the predators that fed on them. And a question in my mind, for example, has been, if you used to have hundreds of millions of um, river herring being harvested and hundreds of thousands of shad being harvested and now you don't, how has that changed the ecosystem and, and the food web? Um, is something else filled the place? Um, have, the, have their predators turned to something else or has the predators been affected? So the answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. he, he follows up, it's, it says, the point of my question is spillover benefits. And I think you, you highlighted that in terms of the forage base mm -hmm. that these fish play as younger fish yes. um, in feeding other animals that, that we care about. Um, so this, this one you may choose not to answer if, if you wish, but I'll ask it anyway. Michael Brubacher, and I'm sorry, Michael, if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Um, do we hold dam operators such as Exelon at Conowingo accountable on a monetary or resource depletion basis 
in terms of their restoration contributions? Well, that's a question for an economist. We've got economists on the staff here. <laughs> Could answer that. I, I think that there's been a strong effort from what I read in uh, uh, the uh, Bay Journal, monthly Bay Journal, there's been a strong effort to try and get Exxon and other organizations like that to realize how much damage they have been costing and try to put an economic value on it and try to get them to do something about it, whatever do something means. It doesn't always work. Uh, but I think that an economist would say, yeah, we, we can estimate what the costs to the system are. And then politically, you have to try and, and get them to do something about it. Um, so a gentleman called Charlie says, what impact do invasive species have on restoration efforts? Well, interestingly enough, it depends. Uh, for example, if you're trying to restore uh, some of the fish, uh, if, let's say that we had a reasonable number of shad and, and river herring coming back, there are two catfish that have been introduced into uh, Maryland and Virginia waters, uh, which seem to be voracious kind of, uh, of predators on other fish in the bay, which is a concern uh, for the, uh, uh, the resource managers. And there's also the, um, what was that? Uh, uh, something head. Oh yeah, snakehead. Snakehead. Snake the snakehead fish that uh, years ago, which also apparently is quite a voracious. So yeah, there are, amongst the fish, some of the introduced species can be a real problem. Um, oh, and uh, with regard to the oysters, at least one of the diseases that had, was having a huge effect on them apparently was brought in to Chesapeake Bay from uh, some oysters from overseas, yep. uh, and uh, it's now in the bay and was causing problems and has caused problems now. Right. So a couple of questions about aquaculture. The first one was, do commercial aquaculture operations work the way you described the Horn Point hatchery as having worked? Tanks, growing in tanks, um, do they produce their own larvae or do they buy larvae somewhere else? or? Do they just grow oysters on, on the bottom? Well, it's a mix of all of those, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think there's a big hatchery that's supposed to be starting up in Eastern Shore, which is going to be like the Horn Point model of getting brood stock, um, and getting them ready to spawn and spawning, and then rearing the larvae for a period of time before putting them in some kind of a, a system over in the river. You can't, in a hatchery, keep oysters for more than um, a couple of weeks a small oyster spat uh, because you can't generate enough food to feed them. So you let Mother Nature do that. So that's, I think, one of the things that's happening. Others are buying um, spat on shelf from hatcheries, either in Virginia or in Maryland, and they're taking that spat and they're putting it into special systems that they have to uh, move water quickly past these, water car carrying food past these animals so that they grow faster. And others are just taking oysters and, and holding them over, over, over uh, uh, in the water and uh, eventually if they're growing well, selling them. Right. So it's a mix. Yep. Um, another interesting question. I'm always impressed by the, the standard of the questions that we receive. This from Paul Tauman. Um, sorry, Tauman. Should aquaculture who are using public trust waters have to pay a performance bond or user fees? Uh, let's find an economy. <laughs> I don't know what, what is, uh, is implied by that. They certainly should contribute to aspects of maintaining the system in good shape. Yeah. They, they certainly should not make it worse. So, but I don't know what a performance bond would mean necessarily or what have. But it, it, uh, these are not free resources. Uh, they come at a cost. And if you're not paying it, somebody else is. And I think that's at the heart of the question, isn't it? That we have tend to think of these systems as providing services for free. Mm -hmm. and, and there is always a cost mm -hmm. uh, associated with it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I could be going on for um, a long time asking qu questions. Um, I will ask one last question and then uh, encourage those who haven't had their questions asked um, to, to contact us directly and we'll 
pass the question on to Vic, mm -hmm. but it was a question about horseshoe crabs. You, you didn't talk about horseshoe crabs other than in the first slide of right. the, the, the original sort of 1500 picture. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether you would say something about uh, the status of horseshoe crabs. Well, as I understand it, first of all, horseshoe crabs are very important with regard to uh, the eggs that they shed, uh, especially in Delaware Bay and down here, being available to uh, migrating shorebirds that feed upon them. And there was a period of time when horseshoe crabs were being harvested and used as bait for some sort of a fisheries, especially in Delaware. And the environmentalists pointed out to the Delaware managers that this didn't make sense, it was having an effect on the shorebirds. And so laws were passed that now will limit the amount of harvesting of uh, the horseshoe crabs. The other thing, of course, is that one of the aspects of their blood is now being used medically. And what you can do there, as I understand it, is you can puncture the horseshoe crabs um, circulatory system and extract some of that and it doesn't kill the crab. Uh, and so there are rules protecting the horseshoe crab uh, at the moment that, that as far as I know, are keeping the population uh, from declining and maybe allowing it to increase. But it's a very important uh, species, but it wasn't commercially important in the Bay. I didn't include it. Uh, and there were other species that I could have talked about, but yeah, uh, it's being protected as I understand it, certainly by laws in Delaware and across in Maryland. So um, Vic, I, I want to thank you for um, your presentation this evening. It is always fascinating to learn um, how the past influences the decisions that we make um, today. If you have questions that weren't answered, um, please email Sarah, Sarah Brzezinski. Her email um, is uh, available on our website. Um, and uh, I encourage you all to come back next Tuesday when we will have Dr. Michael Gonsior, um, one of our faculty here, talking about um, what's in your water and particularly looking at some of the techniques that they use to track and trace water from septic si systems and how it moves through, um, through the, the, the land. So um, Vic, once again, thank you very, very much for the presentation this, this mm -hmm. evening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you all next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.